So thank you so much for inviting me here to talk. Uh, I come from one building away. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we should not let these mysteries linger any longer, so let's dig in. Uh, so, I mean, we all know what convolution neural networks are. They are essentially nested compositions of affine functions. You plug in an image from the left, you get some probability vector uh, that uh, about your class conditionals uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'll abstract the training of a neural network as an optimization problem. X star equals argument of f of x. X are the parameters we are trying to find. X are the weights of the neural network. And f of x is the loss function. f of x is a non-convex function in x. It is the average uh, misprediction error over your entire data set with respect to the ground truth labels. Now, uh, this is a difficult optimization problem. It is non-convex. It is very high dimensional because you would like to capture a lot of variability in your data. Uh, there is one simple algorithm, however, which we all use every day, and it is stochastic random descent. It is not. Uh, it is a very rudimentary algorithm. At each step, it takes. Uh, uh, it moves a little bit in the direction of the negative gradient, which is uh, given by gradient of f sub b. The sub b denotes that this gradient is evaluated on a small subset of your data, not the entire data set. This and b is the batch size. The step size, uh, how much you move, is denoted by eta. The stochasticity of stochastic gradient descent really lie, uh, comes in because of this script b here, because this gradient is a noisy estimate of the gradient on your entire data set. And this is very old, so this comes all the way from like uh, 1956 uh, uh, Monroe. And there are many, many, many variants of stochastic gradient descent, all of whom are faster than stochastic gradient descent on paper. So in deep learning, things like Adagrad, RMS, Prop, Adam are quite popular. Uh, used to be popular until like a, until a year or so ago. In the convex optimization literature, there would be things like SVRG, Catalyst, uh, uh, Natasha, Katusha, and then there is a long lineage of these kinds of algorithms. And the names might actually become funnier down the line. Uh, but uh, the key point I would like to make is that, uh, look at this picture. This picture shows uh, all the networks that have performed well on ImageNet in the recent past. And as, of course, you want better and better numbers, the size of your networks keeps increasing, you come up with better architectures, so on and so forth. But one thing is completely constant. All of these networks were trained with stochastic gradient descent. As soon as you start fighting for numbers, you train things with stochastic gradient descent. In the reinforcement learning literature, it is a little more common to use things like Adam, where, where you don't have to worry so much about tuning the step size and the learning rates. So the key question I would like to ask in this talk is, why is such a simple algorithm so special? Why does it work for such a last, last class of problems? Why, on top of it, it gives you such nice answers? Let me first ask, uh, Question before that, so is stochastic gradient descent special? And it is, after all, just this particular equation. There is nothing special about this equation. Uh, and here is an experiment you can do. So I took a convolution neural network on MNIST, and I computed the Hessian of this neural network after it has finished training. So I trained the network for some time, and it converges somewhere, and you try to compute the Hessian at that location using automatic differentiation. And what I'm showing you here is the eigenspectrum of the Hessian. The Hessian is a matrix that measures the curvature of your loss function. And what you'll immediately notice is that when you're throwing these millions of weights into your neural network, almost 95% of the eigenvalues at this location are simply zero. Effectively, if you visualize yourself as standing at this location, any which direction that you look at, it is basically the loss function is basically flat. There are, of course, a few positive eigenvalues, and these are the directions in which the loss function increases locally. And if you zoom in near the origin, there are also a few negative eigenvalues. So the location that stochastic gradient descent has found in this very nasty optimization problem is uh, a saddle point. It is not a local minimum. The key point about this picture is that this is quite universal. So irrespective of what data set you plug into your network, irrespective of what architectures you use, RNNs uh, on text data, or CNNs on image data, the Hessian <coughs> after optimization looks like this. Stochastic gradient descent, when it works well, obtains region, uh, re, uh, converges to regions that are wide in the energy landscape. And in order to kind of understand how this happens or how hard it is to go to these regions, let me show you a few results from the world of statistical physics. 
What I've drawn for you here is the energy landscape of a binary perceptron. This is the simplest possible net neural network you can build. It has one layer and its synapses are plus one or minus one. And every single point in this circle is one binary perceptron. The red points and the blue cluster of solutions are all, of perceptrons are all the perceptrons which obtain zero error on your training set. Red regions, are, red points are the ones which do not have a lot of solutions in their neighborhood. They are isolated ones. So these are the discrete equivalents of a sharp regions in your energy landscape. The blue cluster of solutions is what we would call a wide minimum in the discrete world. It has every single solution in this blue cluster has lots of solutions in its neighborhood that it perform equally well on your training data. So these are the wide minimums. And what we'll immediately notice is that uh, there are so many red regions and so few blue regions. You want to reach the blue regions because results in statistical physics predict that the blue regions obtain better generalization error. They are more robust to perturbations of your weight, so on and so forth. Uh, so you want to reach these blue regions, but they are extremely hard to find. This is what you would call a last deviations phenomenon. You cannot reach there with local algorithms. It is extremely remarkable that stochastic gradient descent finds such regions in the first place. Let's help it a little bit along the way. We are going to tilt the Gibbs distribution. The Gibbs distribution is a probability measure that puts equal mass on all the solutions of a perceptron. And we are going to tilt it a little bit so that it puts more mass on the blue cluster, uh, so that it becomes easier to find. And here's a very simple trick to do it. So I'm taking my original optimization problem, arc min of f of x. You'll rewrite that as arc max of e to the negative f. So you haven't done anything yet. You've simply magnified your problem. In fact, if your energy landscape was rugged to begin with, you've made it even worse by this magnification. I'm going to smooth this new loss function using a Gaussian kernel. So G sub gamma is a Gaussian kernel of variance gamma. And what such a smoothing does is that it destroys all regions in the parameter space, which are very high curvature. And all that you're left with is these wide regions. Minimizing this function, this function is uh, kind of a, a local way of measuring your free energy or we, you could, uh, we call it local entropy. You can minimize this function using techniques from Markov chain Monte Carlo. And because you are explicitly seeking out these wide regions, this works remarkably well. So we've had uh, some papers that construct distributed variants of this Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm and you get some of the best performance uh, for training neural networks. Optimizing that loss function using uh, uh, variants uh, of MCMC algorithms is almost two to five times faster than stochastic gradient descent. So on this plot, the black line is uh, uh, the test error of stochastic gradient descent. And you will see that even after your first epoch, you're already sitting somewhere pretty close to what you end up with. So this works really well. And more importantly, it obtains better generalization error. It also works really well if you don't give a lot of data to this distributor optimization system. So imagine a cluster of computers, each of them minimizing this loss function on disjoint subsets of data. You get, you kind of trade off the improvement in generalization and we are even faster. By manipulating the Gibbs distribution, by putting more weight on regions that you know are better for generalization, you've constructed better algorithms than stochastic gradient descent, which was one of the best algorithms to begin with. So now that uh, uh, you kind of, you, you might be convinced that there is something special inside stochastic gradient descent, it finds these regions magically. Uh, let us try to understand why it finds such regions. Uh, and these are two, uh, there are two quantities which we'll uh, play with for the rest of this talk. The first quantity is the variance of your minibus gradients. So this is a matrix whose size is number of weights times number of weights. And it is simply uh, the uh, gradient on each of your samples, which is gradient of F on the kth sample, minus the average gradient on your entire data set. So this is the covariance matrix of your gradients. Uh, if B is the batch size, the variance on gradient scales as one over B, if you're sampling examples for your mini batch uh, with replacement. So as B goes to infinity, the variance goes to zero. And this, D, uh, this matrix D is what we'll worry ourselves with. There's another parameter, the magnitude of noise that sits on top of the variance, which a physicist would call temperature. In our world, it is simply the ratio between learning rate and the step size. So I will denote this by a parameter beta inverse, which is 
eta, which is a set size, divided by batch size, divided by 2. Okay? What we are going to do now is take the discrete time updates of stochastic gradient descent, which is simply the gradient eta times uh, gradient of f sub b, and take the continuous limit of these updates. When you take the limit, you get a stochastic differential equation as opposed to a discrete time update equation. The first term of this stochastic differential equation is the gradient on your full data set. So it is a deterministic drift term. It is modulated by a stochastic second term, and you are really assuming that the gradients on your data set are distributed Gaussian with zero mean, and a variance that is exactly d times beta inverse. So beta inverse is like the magnitude of noise, if you will, and d is the directions of all these noise. D is, yes? Sorry, you mentioned here that you assume that the, 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 these like the motion, like the Gaussian uh, mm -hmm. Doesn't it depend on the, on the size of the minimum? Uh, that is inside beta. So beta inverse is uh, the step size divided by the batch size. Well, no, what I mean is that you, you, your justification for it being Gaussian is that it's like a average of singularity dependent, right? Mm -hmm. So does it hold for small mini batches? It, it holds for small mini batches. You are really like leaving aside the moments. This is not to do with the batch size, it is about to do with the distribution. But this is the continuous time equation and you can show that it converges, the trajectories of the discrete time updates are close to the trajectories of this continuous time equation uh, on any test function that you pick uh, using like things like order one week, week approximation of stochastic processes. We are going to study this differential equation now. And what we are going to, what we are interested in is the distribution on the weight space that stochastic gradient descent induces. We are not interested in one particular location that stochastic gradient descent converges to. We are interested in the entire distribution of solutions starting from any initial condition. This distribution flows according to a very famous partial differential equation. It is called the Fokker Planck equation. It is again uh, rho is the distribution. Uh, rho sub t, which is the derivative of this distribution with respect to time, is the divergence of your gradient flow field, which is gradient of f and that is the deterministic term again. And another term which essentially looks like a heat equation. So this, this is the diffusion that your stochasticity in stochastic gradient descent gives you. And we are going to study how the solutions of this equation look like. Let's, uh, uh, let, let's kind of simplify the problem a little bit and see how the heat equation looks. So heat equation is the case when you have no gradient, the gradient of f is zero and the variance of your minibus gradient is exactly identity. So this is what uh, divergence of the gradient is the Laplacian, and you are trying to study the heat equation. Trajectories of the heat equation are steepest descent of a variation energy called the Dirichlet energy. So minimizing this functional with respect to rho gives you trajectories of the heat equation. And this is kind of very natural because if you have the diffusion equation flowing on something, it tries to flatten everything out. So it is trying to minimize the gradient squared over your entire domain. One of the most beautiful results in optimal transportation is that this exact same partial differential equation can also be seen as steepest descent in the Wasserstein metric of a functional that you and I know very well of the entropy. If I take entropy, which is integral of log rho d rho, and take the steepest descent of this functional in the Wasserstein metric. So this would be given by something like a proximal point iteration in the world of distributions. You get exactly the trajectories of the heat equation. You should really compare this to deterministic optimization where you have some deterministic algorithm which is trying to minimize some function and it is doing steepest descent in the Euclidean metric. <laughs> I am a control theorist, so I like to think of these things as Lyapunov functionals. In the deterministic world, you come up with a Lyapunov functional for your optimization. In the variational world, you come up with a Lyapunov functional. And this is minimized monotonically in the direction of steepest descent uh, in the Wasserstein metric by the heat equation. What happens when you add a drift term? So you now get a Fokker Planck equation with the blue term before. And you have a very similar result. And it is in fact very, very famous by this name called JKO functional. You still have the entropy as the second term, so you are minimizing the negative entropy along the trajectories of the Fokker-Planck equation. 
At the same time, you are minimizing the average of your loss function f of x. Remember, you are taking gradient steps on your loss function f of x while doing gradient descent. And in the variational sense, the solution, the posterior distribution on the weight space that this algorithm finds, minimizes the expectation with respect to f of x, which is kind of very natural to think about if you uh, compare this to things like uh, uh, evidence lower bound or variation inference. Again, this functional is a Lyapunov functional for trajectories of the focal plank equation. The key point I want you to remember is that the D matrix here is identity. If the D matrix is identity, then you have this function. Okay. If D is not identity, then you get a very general focal plank equation of this form. All the quantities on the right hand side are functions of x, by the way. Uh, and you get a result, you get uh, that the trajectories of this general focal plank equation minimize another free energy monotonically. Contrast this with the function used on the previous slide. You again have a negative entropic term, but the first term on this equation is not the average with respect to your original loss f of x. In order to explain this, let me first try to focus on the second term here. So, uh, the focal plank equation or stochastic gradient descent in the variational sense likes to have posteriors that are as entropic as possible. So you want to spread around the mass in the entire parameter space. And that is why you have a term that is negative entropy here. Beta inverse, as we pointed out before, is exactly the ratio of step size and uh, uh, divided by the batch size. So when you are training neural networks with very large, uh, very large uh, learning rates or very small batch sizes, this regularization term is very high. When you see in uh, current literature that stochastic gradient descent is an implicit regularizer while doing machine learning, this is the implicit regularization, uh, uh, regularization that is going on inside stochastic gradient descent. It is exactly an entropic bias uh, in the variational sense. Uh, another key property I want to mention is that uh, you were taking gradient steps on a loss function f of x. You thought the hard part of this problem was minimizing it in the non-convex world. But stochastic gradient descent sneakily is minimizing a completely different function, phi of x. Phi of x in general is not your original loss. In fact, for deep networks, they will be kind of very interestingly different. You can rewrite this free energy as the k divergence between rho, which is your current state, which is the current distribution, and the steady state distribution, which is the solution of the focal plank equation. And conceptually, you should compare this to deterministic optimization again. If I told you I have gradient descent and it is minimizing x minus x star, where x star is the solution of my problem, you would say, ah, no big deal. Of course, it is an optimization algorithm which minimizes x minus x star for a convex problem. The key point is that this functional is being minim minimized monotonically. So you're not allowed to de descend up. It is a Lyapunov functional for your problem, even for the completely general focal plank equation. As soon as you write down a, f a functional of this form, you can kind of uh, get a lot of properties out of it. The functional phi is actually the log, log density of your steady state solution, log of rho xs. It is not f of x. And we'll come to this again later. Formally, the statement looks like this. You are minimizing the k divergence between your state and the steady state distribution. The uh, coefficient on the regularizer term, the entropy of rho, was exactly beta inverse. Of course, uh, now you know that you would like to regularize the distribution of stochastic gradient descent in the variational sense. You don't want this ratio to be too small. If, uh, you, as soon as you increase batch sizes, you will see that generalizing performance of neural networks diminishes, and this is why it does. So you would now want to ask questions like, should I increase the learning rate uh, as square root of batch size, as 0.1 times batch size, so on and so forth, but no, it should really be changing the learning rate as a linear function of batch size to maintain the stochasticity in stochastic gradient descent and maintain the regularization that it has implicitly. As soon as you trouble this, uh, generalization goes out of the window. In fact, if you compute a beta for sampling with replacement, as is done in every single library out there, you will see that you get an extra factor, which is 1 minus batch size divided by the total number of samples in your data set. As your batch size approaches the size of the data set, this goes to 0. The regularization inside SGD goes to 0 if you are sampling with replacement. 
This is a one-line change in every single library out there. You should really be sampling mini batches with replacement, not without replacement. It has better regularization properties. And you'll also notice this when you do experiments. So sampling with replacement generalizes better than sampling without replacement. And we haven't seen this so much in literature because we've always been playing with small batch sizes. As, you, as soon as you go to large batch sizes that are comparable to your, the size of a data set, you will notice these effects happen. I, I want to focus on this particular thing. So uh, you might have seen this thing called information bottleneck principle, and it has the following motivation. I am training my ne neural network on a data set. Uh, I would like to minimize the information that my weights retain about the training set so that they become more robust to new examples that they see in the test set. And this gives you better generalization. This is a very natural thing to do, and it has been well motivated by Tishb in the late 90s or recently by Akil and so on. Now, uh, this is again a very natural trade off, right? So, if you minimize the mutual information between your weights and the training set, you are not doing well on the training set. And that is why you're doing well on the test set. You can also see this from a physics sense. If you're working at very high temperatures, which is what is happening in stochastic gradient descent because the batch sizes are too small, you are kind of underfitting on the training set, and that is why you, get, uh, you can hope to get good generalization. If you write down a functional, which is the information bottleneck Lagrangian, it looks like this. You, uh, you, the first term is the average of your variation distribution on your loss f of x. So you are taking gradient steps f of x uh, that minimize the misprediction on your training data. Uh, and this is the average with respect to that loss. The second term that you really get out, uh, uh, out of Jensen's inequality, on the, uh, it is a lower bound on the log likelihood of your data, is the k divergence of your posterior with respect to some prior of your choice. Now, you would like to minimize these functionals in their full generality, and it is very hard to minimize it. So you make approximations. So start making approximations such as mean field uh, distributions on your posterior, you factor out the prior, you fix the variance of the prior, so on and so forth. And that is how you make these problems factor. So in general, minimizing these functionals is very hard. Stochastic gradient descent, as we saw a couple of slides before, has this exact formulation. It minimizes these things naturally. There's another funny thing that happens. So uh, this coefficient beta inverse uh, has been at the root of a lot of debate uh, in recent liter literature. And the reason for it as, is as follows. If you are taking stochastic gradient uh, descent steps to minimize the first term, as we proved a few uh, while ago, you are implicitly enforcing the anentropic prior on the variation distribution. Stochastic gradient descent, when it tries to minimize the first term, implicitly in, in, imposes a uniform prior on your weights. Now, on top of it, externally, if you want to add another prior of your choice, these two priors are going to fight with each other. You are training with some learning rate and some batch size, your new prior externally is some other prior, and in order to control this fight, uh, you want to put such a beta inverse uh, term uh, on the outside, and we typically like to treat it as a hyperparameter in variation inference. We now know why you need to fight so hard to optimize these functionals. Because stochastic gradient descent has an implicit uh, regularizer that it, that it imposes. The solution of the variation problem, nasty though it looks, is actually very easy. It is simply the Gibbs distribution. It is e to the negative beta times p of x. This is the solution of the variation problem we've been talking about. The key point, however, is that it is not e to the negative beta f of x, which is what you would have expected. You were minimizing f of x, you expected to find the Gibbs distribution of this form, turns out it is of this other form. In other words, the most likely locations that stochastic gradient descent finds, which are exactly the local maximizers of this probability distribution, are different than the critical points of the loss function that you, uh, you were minimizing. And you can show that these two distributions are equal, so uh, yes. This is true for, uh, for even if that happens, let's say it's worse for all. Yes. <laughs> Uh, this is, we will see why this is true, so maybe that it becomes clearer later. Uh, the key point is that as soon as the noise in your gradients is not isotropic, as soon as this matrix is not identity, phi is never going to be equal to f. 
Stochastic and descent, it is allowed to move in different dimensions by the noise that your data has, by the noise that the architecture induces, so on and so forth. As soon as it is not allowed to move in all directions, as soon as the Markov chain underlying stochastic gradient descent is out of balance, which is uh, loses detailed balance, you have a result like this. The function you're minimizing is something else. For deep networks, stochastic gradient descent is drastically uh, out of balance. The noise matrix or the variance of minibus gradients in deep networks is extremely, extremely low rank. So imagine this network, which uh, in this particular experiment has about 25,000 weights, but imagine throwing a million uh, weights in a neural network. The stochasticity of stochastic gradient descent really lies in a subspace that can be as small as 0.5%. This is where all the magic happens, and the rest of it is simply gradient descent. If you take a richer data set, you would imagine that the gradients have higher variance, and indeed, so the rank goes up, and the eigenvalues are shifted a little bit to the right. You have found a quantity that you can kind of understand. Computing this matrix D of X does not require training a neural network. All you have to do is one, it, one iteration over your entire data set, and you can compute this eigenspectrum. So you found a quantity which predicts how good neural networks should behave without having to train them. And this has fantastic implications for architecture search. Right now, the best way to search for architectures is to hook up an architecture using whichever way, let's say, brute force search or reinforcement learning, so on and so forth, and then train it for 200 epochs, which typically takes a day, and then do the process all over again. Quantities like this, yes? Is this the beginning of training or towards the end? This, so, uh, uh, fantastic question actually. So, uh, this is the eigenspectrum uh, through the process of training, and I've computed it at a few snapshots during training, and the eigenspectrum actually doesn't change very much during training. The eigenspace uh, changes, so you're kind of rotating in the parameter space, but the eigenvalues are quite similar. So this translucent bar is actually at 20% training, and the black bars are, I think, at roughly 75% training. Uh, finding quantities like this that are kind of invariant to the properties of the data set or properties of the architecture is very important because that gives you an indication of what you want to go looking for when you find an architecture that does not work well. It's very fantastic to find more quantities of this form. Why is it though? So why has the current literature missed such an important property that we are opti we end up optimizing a function that we that we never thought we would? Uh, and here's a simple question you can ask yourself. So if I show you these two images, uh, one of a white cat and a white dog, uh, they are not really that different. Most pixels on these two images are white fur. They are very, very similar. The only differences are the eyes, ears, nose, and the labels on these two images that we as humans have put, up, put in. The gradient on these two images that the neural network gets is also quite correlated. And this is why the steps that your stochastic and descent is taking are also quite correlated. This is why the variance of your minibus gradient loses rank. It is an artifact of the data. As soon as you have linear regression acting on such a data to answer John's question, you will also have such effects because they are, they are also coming from your data. Overparameterized linear regression will also naturally lose rank. What happens in convolutional architectures is that you lose rank much more quickly than linear regression. I want to ask a second question. So, uh, does stochastic gradient descent even converge? Uh, if you imagine, uh, you can analyze this pretty rigorously in convex optimization. That stochastic gradient descent converges to some local minimum. And if you if you imagine yourself as a bouncing ball inside a valley, you are just bouncing at the bottom of this valley, and you would write this down as what is called as an unstein uhlenbeck process around a critical point. What you can show is that the most likely trajectories of stochastic gradient descent are not Brownian motion around your critical points. Most likely trajectories are actually limit cycles, they're closed loops in the parameter space. And the reason to understand this, uh, so a visualization of this result goes as follows. So if you are one of these bouncing balls at this local minimum, as soon as you are perturbed from the bottom of the minimum, you are not allowed to go back the direction that you are perturbed from. You have to go around and find this no nice noise dimension to take you downstairs. These are, the, in the limit, these things look like limit cycles. And the way you kind of go about analyzing this is that 
stochastic in descent has a completely stochastic dynamics. There is an inherent deterministic dynamics that is the most likely dynamics under, uh, under the focal Planck equation. This vector field called J of x is essentially the remainder of uh, of e of x, which does not belong to potential. So you 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 know that there is a function f of x. So the gradient of f of x is the gradient of a potential. That everything is fine. You only know that there is something called gradient of phi of x, and you would like to see if the integral of this vector field phi of x is actually a legitimate potential. The difference between these two is what is this leftover vector field. You kind of impose certain conditions upon this vector field, in, uh, which one of them goes as follows. The divergence of this vector field is zero. As soon as you are working in a divergence-free vector field, uh, you know that your dynamics has limit cycles. And you can you analyze these things using Hamiltonian Monte Carlo style techniques. You can also detect these limit cycles in practice. So we have predicted them for the from theory for now. Here's an experiment. I took a very, very long trajectory of stochastic gradient descent, 100,000 epochs on a small neural network. And I'm showing you the fast Fourier transform of the derivative of this trajectory. So k here is the epoch. So this is the ith weight and the k, uh, k plus 1 epoch minus the kth epoch. If this trajectory were really brown in motion, then this fast Fourier transform should be flat relatively flat. What you instead see is that there is a distinct presence of low frequency modes. And these exactly are the relaxations of the einstein Rudolph process. These exactly are the limit cycles. Well, you know that this, this is evidence that stochastic descent does not perform round in motion. It performs something much more periodic in the weight space. Here's an example to show you what this limit cycles, uh, where this limit cycles could be. If this vector field j is zero, if you are minimizing, uh, let's say, some poten uh, the gradient of some potential field, uh, then uh, if you consider a loss function with these two red dots showing two local minima, depending, depending on where you start from, you are going to converge to one of them, completely deterministically. So these are uh, without stochastic so The black lines denote force lines in this particular picture. If j is uh, not too big, what you see is that the vector field is a little skewed. So your critical points move a little bit. So it has the, this is the critical point of the new vector field. And now you have some trajectories that connect these two local minima. So you're allowed to travel across that fairly easily. And this has amazing implications for Markovsky and Monte Carlo because there the challenge is all about moving between local minima. You can also have cases when the vector field is very, very large, in which case uh, stochastic gradient descent is very, very happy to converge around a saddle point. It does not even enter local minima. And if you want to kind of come up with an intuitive explanation for this, you should imagine taking a, a coffee in a mug and then just swirling it round and round. It is going to come up after some time. We spend a lot of effort in understanding whether optimization algorithms converge to saddle points, how fast they escape, they are going to escape uh, 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 at the speed that is governed by the eigenmodes of the saddle point. But stochastic gradient descent, because of the pathological noise that real data incurs or deep architectures amplify, it is perfectly happy to sit around saddle points. In uh, more formally, the statement goes as follows. So this is the continuous time limit of stochastic gradient descent, the first uh, stochastic case. I have a question because could you go back a slide? Huh? Uh, a question related to this uh, to this <coughs> procedure. Because yesterday with this presentation by the Andrea showed empirically that uh, that the, 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 the hidden latent space the rotation is somewhat looks somewhat smooth with his uh, energy fields that he demonstrated. Now, uh, the gradient of this EV is, is also somewhat this smooth, and that's like why stochastic descent works so well, right? Because we can, uh, it, it can navigate uh, this not so smooth uh, latent space in a certain way. Yes. Now, do you think we can uh, apply stochastic uh, descent to, to the Laplacian, basically? To the Laplacian? Yeah. Uh, so the Laplacian is, op is an operator on the space of distributions, but I don't uh, exactly understand what you mean by applying stochastic gradient descent to the. You can apply stochastic gradient descent up to a smoother form of a loss function if that is what you're asking. No, no, I mean, Jan showed us yesterday with this energy diagram we might remember. Yes. Uh, uh, he, he showed us that there is some sort, sort of a hidden latent structure uh, behind uh, the the weights of or, 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 or like the behind the other neural net. Mm -hmm. To say that. 
uh, and these hidden latent structures seem very, very smooth. Yes, so uh, uh, let me try to elaborate upon that thought. So there is a hidden latent structure. It is exactly the structure of this vector field J. This is like the, in a sense, the most natural metric under which you want to look at optimization algorithms for, optimi uh, for neural networks. The way this J changes is, is uh, kind of non-trivial and that is what you want to understand if you, if you are uh, really looking for right metric to uh, analyze stochastic and descent. But uh, the formal result is that the critical points of your loss function uh, f of x are different from the critical points of the new loss function you end up minimizing by a term that scales linearly with the temperature. Deep networks today are trained at high temperatures. We, are, we use large learning rates, we use small batch sizes. This, this formula shows that these two uh, critical points are actually quite different from each other. The limit cycles that I showed you can be very far away from the critical points of the loss function. The limit cycles, in fact, are exactly the critical points of this loss function phi. So the, the black lines. Yes. Sorry, sorry, I insisted. Let me try to understand it better. Mm -hmm. So, does it mean that if I run STD on a function that is strongly complex, this mm -hmm. thing means that it does not convert? So, uh, this thing, uh, yes, you will you will rotate around the local minimum. And, uh, the key point, I think, uh, is that these results hold for non-vanishing step sizes. The step size does not go to zero. But you got these results from uh, Francis Park and Nick Mugin that show that in a strongly complex convergence function, mm -hmm. with constant step size, so step size doesn't change, mm -hmm. it converge. With isotropic noise. No, I mean, this, well, in that case, there's no noise, right? It's a function. Uh, but if you're doing deterministic gradient descent, yes, you will no, converge. So uh, the, uh, I mean, when you write down the loss function as a composition of gray, of loss, losses on your images, you kind of lose what noise is, right? Uh, there is inherent noise in your updates. Uh, so, so. so you're implicitly assuming that all those gradients are, are, are isotropic. Okay. Okay, and, yes. Then I yeah, think, uh, that, that I believe is the key reason why we haven't seen this before, that we haven't looked at uh, stochastic gradient descent with non isotropic noise. But he uses batch size of 1, right? So yes. He, so his noise is not isotropic. And the, uh, no, no, the examples are uh, uncorrelated, right? So you simply assume that the uh, the norm gradient uh, G, GI, GI plus 1 is less than some epsilon, irrespective of what I and J are. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Conceptually speaking, uh, we don't understand very much about non-convex optimization, at least the way it pertains to machine learning. And think of the life of a practitioner right now. So you start off with an architecture. Uh, it may be good, it may be bad. You train it to the best of your abilities. Uh, that is itself a very challenging process. And as we saw, training affects generalization performance in a very, very non-trivial sense. It is hard to get good generalization performance irrespective of whether you downloaded code from GitHub of a published paper. You don't get good generalization, you go back and change your architecture again. And this vicious cycle is what I would like to break. I want training of neural networks to be bulletproof. You give me an architecture, I give you an answer. And that should be the best answer I can give you. That should be a reasonable answer in the least. And this is, this is how we kind of want to start breaking down these things. Right now, they're completely entangled together. To conclude, uh, I want to go back to the first question. Is stochastic gradient descent even special? It is a very rudimentary algorithm, and what we've seen is that it is exactly as simple as it looks. It has very non-trivial effects. These non-trivial effects come from data, they come from architectures. The algorithm itself does not implicitly regularize, does not do anything. We are feeding these things very rich data sets, we are working with very non-trivial architectures, and that is when you see these non-equilibrium effects. This is kind of a very uh, fortuitous coincidence, uh, I would say, of very simple algorithms working on very rich uh, data, and you see a lot of non-trivial effects come up. Uh, the, 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 this work uh, draws very, very heavily from results in physics called non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Uh, and it is indeed magic land, but it is not magic in the sense of optimization. It is magic in the sense of what the optimization does on these problems. Uh, with that, uh, I will conclude uh, and I will take questions if you are not.